VNF, or virtualized network function, refers to the process of virtualizing traditional networking and security functions into services. In practical terms, it means running several vendor products on the same physical hypervisor, allowing you to have best of breed products while easily swapping out and adding services as necessary. A rising trend has been to replace traditional routers and firewalls at the network edge with generic hardware running VNFs on top of popular hypervisors. But as many enterprises are coming to realize, there's major trade-offs that they were not prepared for. As someone who's worked with some of the largest telcos and MSPs in the world to build out these virtual CPEs, these are some of the hard lessons learned along the way. I'm Andy with the CISO Perspective, and today we're going to look at five considerations in virtualizing your network perimeter. Number one, performance. You may already know that you'll be sacrificing some performance when you go to virtual as opposed to physical appliance, but how much you're sacrificing may actually shock you. First of all, vendor performance numbers are all but useless unless they've been configured with your same exact hardware and hypervisor configuration. There's just too many variations of hardware and software configurations to trust anything that wasn't tested in-house. Even identical setups can vary in performance depending on how the hypervisor allocates resources at a given time. A common mistake is to think that you can just throw more resources at the problem to make up for any gaps. The increase is never one for one. As a matter of fact, you start to hit a point of diminishing returns where adding additional resources like CPU does not actually equal better performance. For starters, vendors will usually charge you for virtual CPUs and or memory. So while you may save some money by going to a virtual license, you'll quickly realize that you need to add more CPUs than you would have otherwise with going with a dedicated appliance. CPU reservation on the hypervisor helps by dedicating certain resources to a VM, like in this case, a firewall. And while this helps with variables like CPU resources, the reality is that the firewall VM never gets full access to all the clock cycles for a given core. That's why smaller firewalls with Atom processors and built-in ASICs have beaten out octocore Xeons in resource-intense applications like SSL deep packet inspection. Number two, ASICs. ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Chips, and they're commonly developed and used by security vendors to offload various security functions. In short, they're custom chips that provide very specific duties like IPS inspection, IPsec calculations, firewalling, and many more depending on the type of vendor. This allows them to rely less on CPUs from AMD and Intel and more of their own chips to provide better performance and lower latency. In some cases, you can have as much as 40 gigs going through a firewall with a CPU at 0%. This is because a firewall tries to offload as much as possible so that it doesn't actually have to use expensive CPU cycles. In some cases, only the first packet of a session is handled by the CPU, while all other packets go directly or partially to the custom chip for processing. Of course, when you move to the virtual world, you don't have custom ASICs, and the firewall is competing with the same generic CPU that all other VMs on the same hypervisor are fighting for. With no ASICs to utilize, simple mundane tasks must go all the way up to the CPU. Not only does that mean more CPUs being taken up by your hypervisor, but of course, bigger licenses to purchase. This also means higher latency for certain packets that now have to travel all the way up the stack to the CPU when they otherwise would have never left the physical layer. Number three. Complexity. For all the issues around performance, this point may be the most important and definitely the most overlooked. I've broken the section down into two sections, pre-deployment complexities and post-deployment complexities. Pre-deployment is all around getting your firewall to work inside your virtual environment. This includes things like configuring your hypervisor, firewall sizing, orchestration templates, service chaining if you're using multiple vendors for your network perimeter, and documentation. Because once you finally get all these moving pieces working, you'll want to make sure that it's understandable and repeatable for other teams. Now, even in this most basic example, we're already touching on four or five different skill sets and vendors. Whereas in the past, you only dealt with one security team or vendor. Now you have your hypervisor vendor, your orchestrator that may or may not be the same as your hypervisor, your templates that need to have desired firewall configurations, and you have to make sure your firewall vendor can pass traffic correctly to your other services like a WAN optimization or SD-WAN if you're service chaining. Once you finally got that all up and deployed, now you can move on to post-production, and that takes us to number four on our list, which is troubleshooting. Even the most seasoned networking and security engineers have gotten very good at troubleshooting routers and firewalls, but the new virtualization world brings on new layers of complexities that you have to account for. For example, if a packet is not traversing your virtual box, did the virtual switch pass the traffic correctly? Does your hypervisor have a network ACL enabled on the virtual NIC? Did the firewall block it? Does the firewall pass traffic correctly to the SD-WAN? Did SD-WAN route it properly? Did your hypervisor see that packet on the egress port? 
From a troubleshooting perspective, these questions are your new norm, and you have to make sure that you have a team that understands the flow of your solution, which could change if you decide to use another white box or virtual solution, seeing as how they all vary. And speaking of the hypervisor, you now have this underlying software that needs to be patched and regularly updated, which is downtime and risk you need to account for in your new perimeter. Number five, policy changes. What used to be routine policy changes can now become a nightmare if not managed correctly. What used to be a simple firewall change can now become a change in four different locations. The hypervisor's network ACL, the security group attached to the virtual NIC, the firewall itself, and of course any other services running on the box like your SD-WAN or WAN optimization instance. But again, even in this most basic deployment, you now have three different vendor configurations that need to be managed for routine changes. That's three management solutions, potentially three different IT groups, and potentially three different mistakes that can happen for any given change. In larger organizations with sysops, security, and networking teams, that's potentially three teams that now need to be involved for a basic rule change. While you could use a policy manager with multi-vendor support to ease the day-to-day -day management, that's now become another cost that you need to account for. So that does it for this video, you guys, and I hope you found it informative. Be sure to check out my new site, thecisoperspective.com, for my latest blog entries, past video research, and much more. Please comment, hit like, subscribe to stay on top of our latest releases here at the CISO Perspective.